Hello and welcome to the pre-lecture recording for um, the Psych Modules uh, lecture on psychotic disorders. This um, is showing the suggested reading and viewing. Um, so I added in a little recommended viewing for um, the psychotic disorders lecture. It's a TED talk. I posted it um, on Blackboard and you, you can watch it right within Blackboard to make it a little bit easier. Um, it's my favorite TED talk. It's one of the best ones I've ever seen. And it just really gives you some really great insight into what it could be like um, for somebody having a psychotic break and um, what the kinds of thoughts and feelings and emotions that um, arise throughout that entire experience uh, come up. For the lecture objectives, um, all six of these here are overall objectives for um, the whole psychotic disorders series. For this pre-lecture recording, we're going to focus on the first two. Um, so by the end of this recording, I hope that you'll be able to identify and discriminate between signs, um, symptoms, and diagnostic criteria for psychotic spectrum disorders. And you'll be able to re recognize the neurotransmitters and brain centers associated with models of psychosis and movement disorders. So just to give a bit of an overview and to really... Um, just touch on the definitions. I'm not sure why the um, top line of this is grayed out. I guess I'll have to look at my slides and make sure I didn't make any mistakes there. But um, So just to define psychosis, what's happening with psychosis is that you have the presence of delusions, hallucinations, and or strange or unreal experiences or severe alterations in sensoria. So what that means is just in, in plain terms, the person is not in touch with reality. There's something going on that is happening within that person's brain and that person is perceiving things that are happening that are not in the real world. Then you have delusions and delusions are simply defined as fixed false beliefs. So these are unwavering. They will not change even when the person is presented with evidence to the contrary. So you can have all sorts of types of delusions. Persecutory are the ones where like people are um, afraid that people are after them or that um, something terrible is going to happen to them. Um, somatic is like when people um, feel like there are you know bugs inside of their stomach and that they can feel them crawling around in their stomach. Um, grandiose delusions are people thinking that they're the president of the United States and that they um, you know have the ability to do a whole bunch of different things, so on and so forth. You guys could Google if you're really interested and see types of delusions people have. They're pretty fascinating, um, but the the most important thing to remember about delusions is that. They really cannot change um, even when the person is presented with evidence to the contrary. Then you have hallucinations, which are not delusions. They're separate. Hallucinations are perceptions that are occurring without an external stimulus. Now what that means is that the person has, for some reason, something inside of their brain, so we call that an internal stimulus, is telling them that something's going on. So that could be like an auditory hallucination, which is like hearing voices or hearing certain sounds. And the interesting thing that happens is they've actually done um, some like MRIs and imaging and, and um, various other types of studies to find that the anatomy within the ears actually moves the same way when people with schizophrenia are experiencing an auditory hallucination as if somebody without schizophrenia was just listening to something. So the ears are actually perceiving that noises are happening, that sounds or voices or whatever um, are actually happening and the person is perceiving those things happening. Um, and again, that's internal stimuli. So that means that there are voices. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the voices in their head, the, the voices that are saying something within internal stimuli. It's important to remember. Visual hallucinations tend to be not so common in schizophrenia spectrum disorders, but they tend to be more common in people who are undergoing alcohol withdrawal, which we'll talk quite a bit about uh, when we get to the alcohol lecture, the substance use disorders lecture. And they're also pretty common in people with um, Parkinson's um, or Parkinson's dementia when they start to develop, um, if, if they start to develop certain psychotic symptoms, visual hallucinations tend to be quite common. You can also have what's 
tends to be referred to as normal hallucinations. And these are hallucinations that happen when people are either falling asleep or when they're waking up from sleep. So hypnagogic are the hallucinations that occur when people are in, in the stages of falling asleep. So this is like between wakefulness and stage one sleep. You could kind of imagine that it happens there. And then hypnopompic are hallucinations that occur when people are waking up. Um, and again, that's between stage one sleep and, and wakefulness. And so those are totally normal. And so sometimes um, if you hear a patient talk about, you know, I've been seeing things at night, um, you want to make sure if they're saying they're seeing things at night, you want to really ask a whole bunch of questions about what time is this happening? What are you doing at this time? What are the things that you're seeing? Um, the things that tend to be more common with hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations are like certain shadows or like movements in the room that they're sitting in and those types of things. So a couple more definitions. Disorganized thinking refers to people who, while they're, um, it, even though it's thinking, it comes out with their words. And so we can tell that they have disorganized thinking by the way that they're talking and behaving. So they may be, while talking, switching topics very quickly. Um, the topics that they're talking about may only be loosely related or totally unrelated. Um, and it could be like if you ask them a question, they may um, have an answer for you that has nothing to do with the question that, they, that you just asked. Um, sometimes it's completely incomprehensible speech and they'll just be saying words for, for no reason whatsoever and they're not in formulated sentences and that's referred to as word salad and that presentation is actually quite rare. You can also have disorganized behavior. So that does also indicate disorganized thinking, but this is what people are actually doing. So um, there's a wide range of different types of disorganized behavior. Again, this is something you could read more, to, more into if you were really interested in it. You can have people kind of behaving more like childlike and being quite silly. Um, and you can also have people being very you know, unpredictable. You don't know what they're going to do, do next. They might be dangerous. They could be very agitated and, and quite threatening. However, that's not very common in people with psychotic disorders. And they could also develop catatonia, which we talked a little bit about in the depression lecture, where somebody might be... Uh, totally unresponsive and maybe not opening their mouth, not getting out of bed or moving at all, um, which again, just to remind everybody, is considered a medical emergency that requires immediate treatment. Then for negative symptoms, and we'll talk about the difference between negative and positive symptoms when we get into the diagnostic criteria, but just to give, an, give you an idea of what these negative symptoms are. The hallmark negative symptoms that happen in people with schizophrenia are reduced emotional expression. And so that's like their face, they, you know, they, they may not move their eyebrows or smile um, or squint their eyes in certain ways, like to respond and, and have sort of um, more responsive body language to how other people, when, when other people are talking to them. And that's referred to as a flat or a blunted affect. So if they're depressed, they may not even look sad. Or if they're very happy, they may not look happy at all. If they're angry, they may tell you that they feel angry for some reason, but they don't actually show that expression whatsoever on their face. That's, that's the flat or blunted affect. They may also have reduced motivation in purposeful acts. So it's just they, they are not motivated to do the things that maybe the, uh, a typical person without schizophrenia would be motivated to do. And that's called avolition. Then they could also have reduced interest or pleasure, which, if you'll remember, is one of the hallmark symptoms of depression, and that's referred to as anhedonia. So within the psychotic disorders, there's really quite of a spectrum, um, and we refer to this as, you know, kind of the schizophrenia disorder spectrum or the psychotic disorder spectrum. And this isn't really to say that any one of these is better or worse than the others. It's just to kind of highlight that there are quite a few different disorders. Um, all of these are under the psychotic disorders chapter within the um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5th edition, except for um, schizotypal personality disorder, which is under the personality disorders chapter. So you can have things like delusional disorder where somebody just only has the delusion, but they may not have all of the other symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, you can have some other symptoms. You can have catatonia, a brief psychotic disorder, um, schizophreniform disorder. Um, and, and these two um, are 
they can definitely be difficult to distinguish and you don't really see them diagnosed very often because they, um, and most of the time when people have symptoms of psychosis, it's usually attributed to either schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or some sort of, um, some sort of delirium or something else going on. Um, and that's when you see psychosis due to substances, medications, or other medical or psychiatric illnesses. So for the purposes of needing, what you need to know for CDM4, uh, we'll be focusing mostly on schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. <clears throat> so the DSM-5 criteria within schizophrenia, um, on this slide, if you're going through this with your um, student slide deck, um, which is supposed to be basically the same thing as this one. I've added in the extra um, criteria letters. You don't need to know these letters. Just um, It just added them in to make it a little bit easier to uh, organize. So criterion A of schizophrenia disorder is basically most of the, the hallmark symptoms that we think of when we think of um, schizophrenia. So patients will have at least two of, the, of what's listed here. And of the two that are that a, the patient has, one of them has to be either delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech. And it has to be going on for at least a month. Um, however, it could be less than a month if the person um, seeks, you know, emergent treatment and, and gets admitted to the hospital and then gets successfully treated. So these are so the positive symptoms are delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. So the first four are the positive symptoms. And then the negative symptoms are like the ones that we just talked about and just defined. So you have, you know, the, um, the flat or blunted affect, abolition, anhedonia, and the list kind of goes on and on. You just think of with negative symptoms, it's, it's basically people uh, kind of not really engaging in society the way that you would normally expect. The big thing to remember with schizophrenia is that all of these symptoms must be outside of cultural norms. So in other areas of the country, um, some of these things, people talking about certain things, uh, maybe in America might sound like delusions, but maybe in some other you know, developing nations or in some rural areas in Africa or somewhere, maybe those things um, are actually quite, quite normal. Um, so you need to always remember that there are, um, the cultural norms need to be taken into account. Then criterion B is just um, one of the typical things for any psychiatric disorder. So there's a dramatic reduction in level of social and occupational functioning since the symptom onset. And criterion C is the duration. So it's been continuous um, for at least six months. So what this means is while the criterion A symptoms have to have been happening for at least a month, that means that they're having like a schizophrenia episode, a psychotic break, something is happening that is different than normal. However, with what criterion C is saying is that there's been some indication of something being wrong for longer than just this one month, or maybe it's been a couple weeks. Most of the time, and we'll talk about this when we get to the clinical course of the illness, Patients have symptoms for quite a while, um, and it's just that they're kind of low grade, they don't seem very dangerous, and so either the person doesn't seek help or uh, their family members don't seek help for them. Always want to make sure that other psychiatric illnesses have been ruled out. So um, even though the person may be having delusions or hallucinations, um, need to make sure that it's not because of major depressive order, disorder, bipolar disorder, um, and you want to uh, try as, as much as possible to rule out schizoaffective disorder. However, that one can be quite difficult, and we'll talk about how to distinguish those in a minute. Um, in order to rule out these other disorders, you want to make sure that the patient hasn't had also a mood disorder on top of their symptoms that they're currently having. So if you'll notice, major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder are both mood disorders where somebody is depressed in major depression, and in bipolar disorder they're either manic, hypomanic, or depressed. We'll get into the details when we talk about bipolar disorder in that lecture, but all of those are different mood states. In schizoaffective disorder, the person also could be depressed hypomanic or manic. And the difference with schizoaffective disorder is these states also have um, a, a significant psychotic component. So if the person um, 
is in an active phase of symptoms but doesn't have any mood symptoms at all, that's more indicative of schizophrenia. If the person does have mood symptoms, they have to be present only for a minority of the duration of active and residual periods. So maybe somebody does have just small symptoms here and there, like maybe some small depressive symptoms, which we know are definitely part of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, um, but maybe they're not uh, quite as predominant as all of the positive symptoms that, we were, um, that we've defined as part of schizophrenia. So this part can get pretty hairy and hard to um, really distinguish, and so I have another slide that should help try to clarify that more. And the other thing is that none of these symptoms have been attributable to substance or medical illnesses. So something to consider with schizophrenia and continuing the differential diagnosis is um, if a person has a positive history of autism spectrum disorder or a history of some sort of communication disorder, um, you can only make the schizophrenia diagnosis if the person has prominent delusions or hallucinations with other active phase symptoms. So because so many of the symptoms, um, particularly with autism spectrum disorder or communication disorders, can actually look sometimes quite similar to maybe this um, disorganization and negative symptoms, you want to make sure that the person also has delusions or hallucinations before making a symptom of uh, schizophrenia. So then there are also specifiers for schizophrenia, like if it's the person's first episode of psychosis, if they've had multiple episodes of psychosis, or if they're continuously psychotic. You can also specify whether they're currently in acute psychosis or in partial remission or in full remission. And you can do that whether, they have their, whether they're having their first episode or multiple episodes. And you can also um, further kind of unspecified is also a specifier. You can say they, whether or not they have catatonia, and you can also specify the severity, which would be determined when the patient um, or their diagnostician completes a variety of validated rating scales. So with schizoaffective disorder, in this case, you have an uninterrupted period with a major mood episode, which would be a major depressive episode, hypomania or mania, at the same time as meeting all of the subsets of criterion A of schizophrenia. If a person only has um, depression, so they don't have mania, their depression must include a report of depressed mood. If they only say they have reduced interest, then that won't meet the criteria for schizoaffective disorder. Because if you'll remember, that reduced interest could be part of their negative symptoms of their schizophrenia and not part of a major depressive episode. The person should also have a history of delusions or hallucinations for at least two weeks without having a major mood episode. So they have psychotic symptoms whether or not the mood episode is there. The major mood episodes, however, shouldn't be present, they, they should only be present for a minority of the time. So most of the time the person has some sort of psychotic symptoms and then there's periods of time where they'll have mood symptoms that meet criteria for major depression, hypomania, or mania. The disorder or the symptoms rather are not due to substances or other medical illnesses and then there are specifiers. So if the person is experiencing hypomania or mania um, or if they ever have experienced hypomania or mania, we should specify that the person has bipolar type schizoaffective disorder. If they've only ever had symptoms of or rather major depressive episodes on top of their psychotic symptoms, we would specify that they have schizoaffective disorder, depressive type. You can also here specify with or without catatonia and um, note that the episodes, if it's the first episode or recurrent or rather um, multiple episodes or continuous, you can do the same um, kind of specification as is true for um, schizophrenia. And again, with schizoaffective disorder, these symptoms must all be outside of cultural norms. So this is um, this slide is order is is I made this slide in order to help everybody kind of understand the distinction between the different um, diagnoses and and how to differentiate between the two. So, in a case of incredibly severe depression, you can have the episode of you can have a major depressive episode that includes psychotic symptoms without having a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder or even considering schizophrenia. So if we were to say that 
the yellow line, the yellow arrow is, is euthymia and that's normal mood. And the white line is the person's mood trend. So the white line is they're here, they're euthymic, and then their symptoms start, and then they start developing major depression, and then they're in a major depressive episode. And then what happens with this person is that in their major depressive episode, they also have psychotic symptoms, kind of like those ones I was talking about during the depression lecture where maybe they're having persecutory symptoms um, that are really negative. So this psychosis will resolve when the major depressive episode resolves and they'll be completely without any psychotic symptoms at all as long as their depression is adequately treated and in remission. And then if their depression were to come back, it's possible that they may not have any psychosis the next time, but it's also more likely that they would have psychosis because they've had psychosis previously. And so it's possible, again, that they would have a major depressive episode that's particularly severe, that they would have psychotic symptoms, so they might have some delusions or hallucinations, um, and that that psychosis would then start resolving once the symptoms start getting treated and getting better, and the psychosis completely resolves when the person's depression is in remission. In bipolar disorder, you could also have episodes of depression that look kind of similar to the major depressive disorder, but here I just focused only on mania and hypo, or mostly on mania and hypomania. So if the person's mood is, is elevated too high, here we don't have a particularly high mood. We'll just call this hypomania because it's not fully manic. And then we have where the mood comes down and person maybe is mildly depressed and then the mood gets better again and is euthymic. Then maybe they get quite a bit more depressed, but they don't have psychosis. And then maybe their mood gets better again. And then they have an episode of mania where their mood is way too high. Again, this is considered a medical emergency. And they have symptoms of psychosis in this period of time. They don't always, not everybody with mania will experience psychosis, but it's quite common in mania. And so this is just to highlight the fact that people can have psychosis while they're manic and that once that mania gets treated and the person gets back to euthymia, that psychosis can go away. So in schizophrenia, again, the yellow line is mood, that's euthymia. And in, in somebody who only has schizophrenia, their mood should be relatively stable. So you notice I just have a couple ups and downs here just to illustrate the fact that all of us have mood, moods that kind of fluctuate up and down a little bit. Um, but we don't have these, these people without bipolar disorder, without depression, shouldn't have these major um, episodes of excessively elevated mood or excessively depressed mood. The, the hallmark with schizophrenia is that you have psychosis throughout this whole period of time. So there, while in, in contrast to bipolar disorder and major depression where you have these acute episodes of psychosis that happen when the mood state is particularly severe, with schizophrenia the psychosis happens the entire time. So in schizoaffective disorder that is depressed type, I've overlaid the major depressive disorder mood um, pattern here and so you see the person has depressed mood and then it gets better and then it gets depressed again and then it gets better however that psychosis factor is always there so this is the really distinguishing feature between schizoaffective disorder depressed type and major defective major depressive disorder with psychosis in MDD with psychosis the psychosis only happens during the acute depressive episode whereas in schizophrenia the psychosis is happening all of the time same thing goes for schizophrenia bipolar type or schizoaffective disorder bipolar type where while the person may have varying mood states throughout the course of their life, even during periods of mania or during periods of depression or during periods of euthymia, the psychosis is always there. And that's in contrast to bipolar disorder where the psychosis is only present when somebody has a severe, severe uh, major mood episode. Please don't hesitate to ask questions about this in lecture if you guys, um, if this isn't very clear and you guys would like a little bit more clarity um, or just um, review of this. So for the differential diagnosis in schizophrenia, we really have to consider quite a few things. A lot of it is mostly um, other, it's, it, most of it is all um, psych psychiatric disorders and that's because what we really need to consider is things that cause people to have psychotic symptoms and so 
We see psychotic symptoms once psychiatric disorders get particularly severe, so it's more common with very severe depression or um, certain cases of bipolar disorder. Um, we also need to, like I said on the previous slide, we have to rule out schizoaffective disorder if we're considering schizophrenia and vice versa. Um, we need to rule out the other disorders on the schizophrenia spectrum disorder. Um, it's sometimes common for people to start considering whether or not somebody has schizophrenia or, or a primary psychotic disorder when people have very severe obsessive compulsive disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, or post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we really need to make sure we're getting a very thorough history and doing a very um, intense diagnostic workup if these other psychiatric disorders are showing signs of psychosis. We really need to make sure that we're ruling out schizophrenia. So for the clinical course, like I said before, most of the patients have a prodromal period. So what this means is there's a pre-morbid phase before and, and a prodromal period before any of the symptoms really start. So in the pre-morbid phase, in most people with schizophrenia, this, is, this happens during childhood. And so their level of functioning is pretty much on par with most other kids in childhood. And then the prodromal phase starts, and that's where their level of functioning actually starts to dip down. And this mostly comes up because their negative symptoms end up starting to kind of overtake their lives. And they start looking like kids that are more, they might, parents might be concerned that their child is depressed or that they're developing some sort of maybe autism spectrum disorder or other type of communication disorder because they're starting to exhibit a lot of these negative symptoms. The onset of psychosis might be abrupt. It might come up because of some sort of life stressor or something, uh, or it might be insidious and it just kind of brews under the radar for a little while and things just start getting more and more bizarre. And then um, friends, family members, other people surrounding the patient may start noticing that this person's starting to behave very oddly and might need some evaluation. Most people who are going to develop uh, a, a primary psychotic disorder will see that development between sometime in the late teens and early 30s. For males, it tends to be younger, and for females, it tends to be, well, the younger end of the spectrum, and for females, it tends to be the higher end of the spectrum. <clears throat> the initial diagnosis is typically made with the onset of positive symptoms. So while the person may be developing, or de sorry, demonstrating the negative symptoms pretty early on in this prodromal phase, it's, it's very unlikely that the person would seek treatment, that the person's friends or family members would tell the person to seek treatment or take them to the hospital to get evaluated unless something severe was happening. So it, we usually end up, unfortunately, waiting for something severe to happen where the person has florid psychosis um, and needs to be hospitalized in order to keep them safe and keep other people safe. These clinical courses do vary, um, and sometimes people will kind of resolve some of their symptoms. However, most people experience these symptoms chronically for the rest of their lives, and complete remission is not very common. You can see that the level of functioning kind of continues to dwindle slowly over the period of the person's life and just kind of stays at a, at a lower level of functioning um, compared to others that their age. <clears throat> Risk factors for developing schizophrenia include, um, for some reason, growing up in an urban environment. Um, there is a strong genetic component and then it does run in families. However, it's kind of odd in that patients um, with schizophrenia typically don't have um, a direct or a, a um, first degree relative with a family history of psychosis. Um, People who have dealt with pregnancy and birth complications or, or people who had pregnancy and birth complications in their own birth um, are more likely to have um, or develop schizophrenia later in life. And there is a slightly higher incidence in males, but it's not um, that significant. So these risk factors don't really tell us very much, and they don't really tell us the kinds of people or the certain traits that people have that might increase their risk for schizophrenia. These are um, such vague and nonspecific risk factors that they don't really mean that much. And, and what it really tells us is that we can't really predict who's going to develop these disorders. As far as the prognosis goes, there is a relatively high risk of suicide in that 5 to 6 percent of people will complete suicide who have schizophrenia. About 20 percent will make attempts at suicide. 
um, and many more than the people who make attempts or who complete it have suicidal thoughts. A lot of times this is in response to the voices in their head telling them to kill themselves or to commit suicide or harm themselves for a variety of reasons. The risk factors for suicide are the same as for depression or any other type of illness you would expect to see. And so you can remember that um, mnemonic is path warm that I presented in this depression pre-lecture for any of the other types of um, uh, psychiatric illnesses that we talk about. There is substantial social and occupational dysfunction with schizophrenia, like we saw in that clinical course diagram that um, shows that people tend to have significant dysfunction throughout the rest of their lives after they've been diagnosed. <clears throat> the people may be impaired by avolition, which is that lack of motivation, or many of their other symptoms. Most patients um, could be employed, however, uh, or rather, most patients actually are, are not employed, and if they are, they're employed at very low-level type jobs that don't require very much intense um, thought or um, anything like that. And they're, very, they're not very complicated because typically what happens is that they develop a lot of cognitive symptoms that really end up impairing their ability, like we talked about, just to, to function normally. And so they aren't quite capable of performing a lot of complex tasks. Many, so with that, many of these patients are on disability. Comorbidities are very common. About 90% of the people with schizophrenia smoke cigarettes, and this can become very problematic when thinking about some of the medications that we use because some of those medications are metabolized by the same uh, cytochrome P450 enzyme that the smoke from cigarettes inhibits. So um, you can have a lot of drug interactions when it comes to um, starting and stopping medications and starting and stopping smoking in patients with schizophrenia. You definitely see a lot of patients with more metabolic disorder, so obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular diseases, and a lot of this is related to um, people with schizophrenia having a really hard time identifying that they need to kind of take care of themselves, that they need to try to eat nutritious foods um, and maybe, you know, participate in some sort of daily exercise. Um, it's, it's, it's harder for them to be able to recognize that those are things that they should be doing. On top of that, we also start medications that cause a lot of these things. And so not only does their illness make it more easy for them to get these, these types of comorbidities, but we're also giving them medications to treat their schizophrenia that can give them these diagnoses. And also pulmonary diseases are another comorbidity that tends to be quite common and that could be related to their um, common um, smoking or tobacco use disorder. All of these comorbidities are higher in people with schizophrenia, are present at a higher rate in people with schizophrenia than they are present in the general population. So what is actually going on in people that have psychotic disorders? There is lots of neurotransmitter involvement. Um, the biggest one, the most important one is dopamine, and we'll talk a lot about dopamine as we go through this lecture. The connection that dopamine has to psychosis is... Um, that it is hyperactive in the limbic system, and so we see more positive symptoms because of that, and it is hypoactive in the prefrontal cortex, and so we see more negative symptoms because of that. And we'll talk all about the pathways that dopamine is involved in, so this slide, it doesn't really tell us that much about dopamine, but we'll get into a lot more. Serotonin um, is also involved, and we know that because there are certain medications that block serotonin 2A receptors, and we see that that causes an increased dopamine in the prefrontal cortex, which then decreases the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. We also know glutamate is involved, um, or thought to be, because dysregulation is thought to contribute to the psychotic symptoms via the NMDA and MGLUR5 receptors, don't worry, you don't need to know the specifics on these receptors, just know that glutamate dysfunction is involved in psychosis. GABA is also uh, thought to be involved and um, related to the cognitive symptoms that we see. And acetylcholine is also involved in that we know when we block nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, then we see an increase in schizophrenia symptoms. What we also know is that when people with schizophrenia smoke, this is why over 90% of them smoke, their symptoms actually get better. And so if we activate the nicotinic receptors instead of blocking them, some of their symptoms do improve. Also, acetylcholine is involved because um, 
muscarinic receptors are thought to be kind of at a reduced rate or reduced presence in people with schizophrenia. So these are the pathways that I was talking about. Um, these are the predominant dopamine pathways that are involved in schizophrenia. We have the mesocortical pathway, the mesolimbic pathway, the tuberoinfundibular pathway, and the nigrostriatal pathway. And here we talk about what each of those does. So for the anatomy, um, you don't need to know the details of this. This is just kind of telling you the area where the pathway starts and then the area where it ends. But the function is pretty important. So for the mesocortical pathway, this is involved in cognition, social functioning, communication, people, how people feel emotions, and how they respond to those emotions, which is their affect, and their response to stress. So mesocortical pathway is, is heavily involved in the ability to think, feel, um, react, plan, all of that stuff. Mesolimbic pathway is involved in arousal, motivation to do things, stimulus processing. Um, it's somewhat involved in the reward um, pathway as well as memory. The nigrostriatal pathway is predominantly involved in movement and motor planning. And then the tuberoinfundibular pathway is involved in prolactin regulation, such that a dopamine release or increased dopamine release will decrease prolactin release. So it has um, kind of the opposite um, effect or an inverse relationship between dopamine and prolactin. So why are these relevant in schizophrenia? Well, in the mesocortical pathway, we see that there's low dopamine output, and what this causes is negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms. In the mesolimbic pathway, we have high dopamine output, and that causes lots of the positive symptoms, or those criteria, the criteria, subcriteria A, 1 through 4, or all those positive symptoms, and that's the involvement of the um, dysfunction in the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. In the nigrostriatal pathway, in people with schizophrenia, they actually typically have normal dopamine output there and there's no dysfunction. But what happens is that with antipsychotics, we end up blocking dopamine receptors kind of throughout the brain. And so we have dopamine antagonism that causes movement disorders. And so we end up seeing a lot of Parkinson's-like features in patients on certain antipsychotics. And then in the tuberoinfundibular pathway, this also has normal dopamine output in people with schizophrenia, but when we add dopamine blockers, like the antipsychotics, that will cause increased prolactin release, which can actually lead to gynecomastia, which is the breast enlargement in both males and females. It can also be quite painful and uncomfortable for people experiencing it. The symptoms that we're targeting in schizophrenia when we start antipsychotics are divided up into the positive, negative, and cognitive. And so the positive symptoms are a lot of the ones that we already talked about. So the delusions, the hallucinations, the disorganized speech and behavior, any sort of agitation or aggression we of course would want to be addressing. The negative symptoms, again like we talked about, the flat and blunted affect, people actually becoming more emotionally withdrawn or socially withdrawn, and so they're isolating and not really interested in uh, relationships or interactions with other people. People may actually talk less, so reduced speaking, and the uh, vocabulary word for that is alogia. They may report decreased motivation and spontaneity, which we talked about, which is also called avolition, and then decreased pleasure, also called anhedonia. And then for cognitive symptoms, we also start seeing that people will have reduced attention, so inability to, to really pay attention to things, reduced working memory, so inability to form memories based on experiences that they are currently experiencing, and reduced executive functioning. And what's kind of important to remember about these cognitive symptoms is, is if we add them all up, once you um, see the Parkinson's lectures later on in this semester, you may start to see that there is quite a bit of overlap. And so what we see with patients with schizophrenia that tends to be pretty severe with a lot of cognitive symptoms, they may actually show signs um, or, or may look quite a bit like people with dementia and as far as their cognition goes. And then the thing that I forgot to say and the reason there's a little asterisk next to, next to the negative symptoms column is that all of these symptoms, while they do occur in people with untreated schizophrenia, a lot of these symptoms also occur because of the medications that we give to treat schizophrenia. And so it's just important for us to be able to distinguish between whether or not maybe somebody had a symptom before we started a medication and whether or not it got better or worse once we started the medication.
So that concludes the pre-lecture material, or rather pre-lecture recording for the Psychotic Disorders Lecture. Please remember to complete the pre-lecture worksheets on this lecture, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the in-class lecture for this material.